I've described it before as like my job is to yank my heart out through my cunt and smear it all over the internet. So like, oh my god, <laughs> eat your heart out, Walt Women. What's going? Whoa, <laughs> the imagery. But first, a word from our sponsors. Beducated.com teaches you real sex techniques using real people, not just diagrams and pussy puppets. Get 70% off an annual membership with code MANHOR at beducated.com. That's code MANHOR at B E D U C A T E D dot com. Or click the link in the show notes. Tax season is coming up, everybody. It ain't sexy, but it's necessary. And for years, I have been filing with BrassTaxes.com. They offer tax help for freelancers, artists, and as their website calls it, other nice people. The sooner you schedule your first appointment, the cheaper it is to file with them. So if you don't feel like you've been getting your money's worth out of quote-unquote free tax applications, head on over to BrassTaxes.com and schedule a consultation today. Let them know Billy Presida sent you. I'll get a little bit on the back end. BrassTaxes.com. Let's get to the show. Welcome to the Man Or Podcast. Shout out to the Playboys, the Playgirls, the Play With Me's, the On Your Knees. This is Billy Presida, and you're listening to the Man Whore Podcast and Rhymes. Hi, that one was really dumb. What? Welcome to the show this week on the pod. I have got on sex blogger, girl on the net, aka girl, aka got in. I'm not the biggest fan of that last one, but hey, that's what they want to call her. Great. This is a really awesome episode that you may want to listen to in a place that is safe to get accidentally aroused because I know she doesn't mind me saying it, but got in. Oh, the voice on this woman uh, and the fact that like you have no idea what she looks like is delicious. Uh, But first, you know, I'm a shameless attention whore enough to admit I love getting random presents from you people. Ah, best one, I think, still goes out to the hookers. Shout out to the hookers who, who got me a new bed frame one year. You have no idea how cool you people make me look to the other comedians. And so when when I post on Instagram, like, podcast listeners got me a bed. The other comics are like, what? Did Presida? He's not even funny. Wow, wow, that's good for him. So I love the ego boost of all that. <laughs> uh, but so So I was tickled when right before Christmas, three different men named Joe. On OnlyFans, bought me jock straps all in the same week. What a life! What a charmed life I live. You know, the the jock straps—they're apparently very popular with the queers. I got a, a three pack in different colors. I got a, a red, a blue, a black. I got another black jock strap from another brand, and then I got a couple of uh, these cross body suit jock straps. It's like a teeny underwear lacy jock strap thing with these straps that kind of cross my torso and wrap around the neck. I'll put a link in the show notes. It's really hot. I never even thought about jock straps as lingerie before, you know, because I haven't worn a jock strap since high school football senior year. I figured I'd just put some jock straps on my Amazon wish list, see what happens. Jock straps seemed very intimidating to me because I've never thought that covering less of my body made my body look better. Probably because I am not attracted to masculine bodies. So a thick, kind of chubby, kind of strong, hairy chest boy body, you know, it doesn't turn me on. So it's difficult for me to look at my sexy photos and see a sexy person. But yo, I saw myself in these photo sets I took. And I have to tell you, I look damn fucking good in a chalk strap. Like, really good. Um, the, the, apparently the peep show agrees with me, <laughs> you know, jock straps, they perk up my ass, they accentuate my package. And I don't know, it's so, it's so different seeing myself in a sexy jock strap than seeing myself just wearing a pair of boxers. The jock strap is more purposeful. 
The boxers, someone might be wearing those on any given day. You might be in them before or after sex. I'm not in them ever because I go commando. But, you know, when you're wearing a jock strap, you're showing off. And I like showing off. I like it a lot. I don't think we often talk enough about how can boy body people wear something sexy that's lingerie or lingerie-esque. How, do, how does a guy look hot half naked. I've frequently talked about menagerie on this show, um, this little boutique brand on this this guy does on the side, which by the way, I think the promo code manhor should still work at buymenagerie.com. That's B-Y menagerie. I'll have a link in the show. What did I say about the show notes? If you hear me say a URL, it's in the show notes. Anyways, we've talked about menagerie plenty on the show. Uh, last year, I talked to you all about body stockings and how that can be like a hack for dudes to wear to look like hot while partially undressed. But fellas, if you have not considered a jock strap in your life, go scroll around on Amazon, take a little look sees. Or better yet, check out my OnlyFans and see if you feel inspired. Shout out to Jamie LeClaire, by the way, friend of the pod, aka Angel Amore. Ahead of our shoot in October, they told me that uh, the gays love a guy with a big ass and a jock strap. And told me I should try to get my hands on one, which for that shoot, I ended up, (laughs) I had to text a buddy of mine who goes to Hacienda, who is like a similar body type as me, who I also feel close enough to that I felt comfortable asking, hi, that jockstrap I see you wear all the time at the parties, any chance I can borrow it for a photo shoot? And he said, sure. And I was like, wow, is this male bonding? Like, this feels different. I don't know if I overstepped. I mean, are all the dudes exchanging underwear with each other? And and I had no idea because I, I neither have guy friends nor wear underwear on the day-to-day. Uh, so, <laughs> But Angel was so right. Uh, it turns out a lot of uh, women dig the jockstrap look, too. By the way, I've, uh, I posted a bunch of content with Angel on my OnlyFans. Uh, in addition to pictures and whatnot, I have a couple of pussy-eating videos pinned to the top of my page. And if you check your DMs, you probably got a video sent to you of Angel eating, spanking, spreading, and fucking my juicy ass with a variety of toys. Eat your fucking heart out, perverts. Buy my porn <laughs> at OnlyFans.com slash CallMeBilly. And by the way, if you have any like links to some hot men's lingerie or undies or something you think I should be putting on, please, please, please send me a link. I would love to add it to the wish list. You can always email me your comments, your questions, your criticisms, your booby pictures to manhorpod at gmail.com. You know what your New Year's resolution should be? To connect with other like-minded listeners, to connect with other sex-positive peoples in the world on the interwebs. Maybe you're the only one in Oklahoma that you know who knows what polyamory is. Maybe you think you're the only kinkster in Idaho. It is Idaho. I mean, you might be the only one for a few square miles, but you ain't the only one in Idaho. What I'm saying is you should come introduce yourself in the champagne room. The champagne room is our super free, super fun, super sex positive Discord server where we have channels about all sorts of topics, not just about sex. Even though we've got sex toy recommendations, we got sexual achievements Sunday and more. But hey, we've got channels just where people share selfies, channels for memes, channels for pets. We even have one channel where uh, the more ADHD among us... <laughs> I really don't understand this game. It's called the counting game, and they just keep counting. I know it sounds dumb. I think it's dumb, but they're having a blast in our shit posting channel. And they've, I who knows, they're probably up in the 700s by now or something. So the champagne room, it's filled with hundreds and hundreds of fan whores and like minded people. If you're having trouble finding your tribe, come join ours. Introduce yourself today at manhorpod.com slash discord. And before we get to our conversation with Girl on the Net, let's do a quick fan whore appreciation moment. Okay, this is the part of the podcast where I could give a brief shout out to some of the members of my fan whore community on Patreon. Right now, I want to shout out to Alan Kustanovich, whose name has oh so many letters in interesting orders. And I want to say thank you to someone who simply goes by the letter C, 
great letter choice. Unlike Alan, you have very few letters. And maybe if you and Alan got together, y'all could, you know, divvy up all those letters and have some reasonably length names. But Alan C, thank you so much for supporting me and the work I'm doing here on Patreon. And you too can support the podcast for as little as $2 a month. That's all it takes to do your part to keep this podcast moving and grooving. Do your part today, become a member, support the pod you love at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash podcast. And now for this week's guest, Girl on the Net. Oh my, uh, I have been following Girl probably as long as I've been doing this podcast. I reached out to Girl after I saw her share one of her blog posts about privacy in sex blocking. Gotten is anonymous. No one knows who she is. You don't know what she necessarily looks like. If she looks anything like her voice, then she is a fucking knockout. And in her post, she talks about how she gives like quite a bit of veto power to her past lovers in terms of whether or not she's going to write a blog post. And I thought that was really interesting because as many of you know, I started this podcast in 2014 talking to my past partners directly about why we didn't work out. And I've also told many a sex story of my own here. And I think Gotten and I have different ethics, and I thought it'd be interesting to talk about that and, and see how it is we determine, like, kind of what's fair game, what's not fair game, and and how do we tackle sharing our private sex lives so publicly. Let's go chit chat with at girl on the net. Why did I say it like that? That's so fucking weird. The Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by Beducated.com. Beducated is an adult sex ed platform that goes beyond diagrams and pussy puppets and shows you how to do a lot of the real things with real people. Many of Beducated's courses use real live models. And no, it's not porn. They're going to show you how to do a linga massage with a real cock. And they even have courses that don't really require some sort of live model anyway. You've got sex educators who are te- teaching you about, you know, sexual confidence. You got educators who are teaching you about how to open up a relationship. I took a fingering course because, hey, it's it's never a bad time to brush up on your fingering skills. You never know if somebody's kind of like discovered some new Himalayan counterclockwise technique that stimulates something or the other. And I learned some things. I learned some more about the A spot, which I've heard about, but I I didn't really understand. I learned some new positions to kind of like optimize my energy and and arm range of motion. I even learned about something called the U spot. I texted my girlfriend. I was like, yo, I'm learning about how I'm going to stimulate your U spot. She's like, what's a U spot? I said, hey, fuck around and find out. Did I use the phrase right? I'm new to, I'm not, I haven't been on TikTok in a minute. So if you want to get better in bed, you got to get beducated. Ooh, and they are offering Man Whore Podcast listeners an insane deal. Like, truly, it's an insane deal. When you use my promo code MANHOR at beducated.com, you have the option to get a one-day completely free pass to the entire website. And when you use my promo code, you will get 70% off an annual membership, and that rate will be locked in for life. Just to give you an idea of how insane of a deal that is, their yearly pass comes out to about $30 a month. Their monthly pass is $40 a month. They're basically going to get you down to about 8 bucks a month to become a master in the bedroom. You're going to teach yourself skill sets you don't even really feel like you need to know. Like, are you a hetero dude who doesn't give blowjobs? I mean, you can still take a blowjob class because fuck it, you got access. Learn everything. And use my code when you do it. So go to beducated.com, use promo code MANHOR. That's beducated, B E D U C A T E D.com. Or just click the link in the show notes. It's a new year, it's a new you. And why have you not started that new podcast yet? There's no time like the present to get started. And the first thing you need to do to start a new podcast is you need to set up an RSS feed. And there's no better place to host your RSS feed than with Libsyn. I've been hosting with Libsyn since I started this podcast. And every major indie podcaster I know, they use Libsyn. Libsyn's been in this game for forever. They've been handling podcast RSS feeds since before they were even called podcasts. 
I trust no one with the Man Whore Podcast more than with Libsyn. Their customer service is superb, they're quick, and they are efficient. And I can finally offer you up to two months of free hosting services when you use my code BILLY, B-I-L-L-Y, at Libsyn.com. Or you can click the link in the show notes. We love link clicking in the show notes. But again, you can go to Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. Use promo code BILLY. And just because I'm that kind of guy, if you use my code Billy, take a screenshot, email it to me, and I'd be happy to give you a free 20-minute podcasting consultation call. One more time, that's promo code Billy at Libsyn.com. Now let's get to the show. There are loads of things that I don't have to do now that I don't have to be, you know, I don't have to be physically present. So I don't need to wear makeup or care about my clothes or any of that kind of stuff. It's very freeing. (laughs) Yes, I would imagine. Uh, It's a good time to say I'm here right now with a sex blogger. Can't say a name. I just got to use a handle. I'm chatting with at girl on the net. Hi, thank you. And also, the handle is fine. Some people call me G. Some people call me Gotten. Yeah. And so I've I've actually been following you on Twitter for years. And you put out a post recently that oh so much caught my eye about like anonymity and privacy and writing about and talking about our own sex capades and such. Uh, And so I was like, gosh, would love to uh, discuss and or mildly argue about that. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I'm so up for it. I think it's a really interesting topic. And it's one that so many different people are all going to have their different approaches to it as well. And I'm always really interested to know how other people form their ideas around you know how do you write about people or talk about people like what what are your ethical rules and boundaries I think it's really Mm. interesting where was your origin story of blogging about sex so when I first started blogging I was single and I was dating a few different people I also had a ton of stories to tell about past relationships and past boyfriends Um, and when I first started the blog Because it was all very anonymous and because I didn't have that much of a following, the question around, you know, do I need to get individual consent for every post felt a little bit less important because not that many people were reading. So I got consent from um, my ex-boyfriend at the time who I'd had loads of kinky adventures with and done lots of delightful filth. And he said he was fine for me to share our stories. So... I was okay with that and I could share those and everybody else I just anonymized. And then more recently, I've been in a very, very long term relationship. We were together for nearly 10 years. And so again, of course, with him, he was fine for me to share it. He was very encouraging of my work and was happy. You know, I I wrote a whole book about him at one point. He was very happy for me to do that. So now that I'm, we've broken up now and I'm sort of launching myself back into like having some casual fun and dating lots of different people the question raised itself again and I thought okay well I need to come up with a rule for me that makes you know makes sense for me and means I can feel comfortable still doing my work because it it is my full-time job Mm -hmm. so I can't just suddenly stop writing about sex equally part of my brand as a blogger, and I hope as a human being, is that I always want to be kind and want to be nice. So I have to, I thought it was a good point to sort of reassess, you know, how do I make sure I'm getting consent from the people I write about? What level of consent am I going to be asking for? You know, what am I going to be offering them in terms of how much they're allowed to edit or make suggestions, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I thought, yeah, that post was kind of my way of setting my stall out, as it were, and saying, this is what you can expect if you're someone who's been kind enough to dick me. You know, it was interesting because you say, you know, this is the full-time job, which like, fuck yeah, we get to just talk about where our genitals have been uh, (laughs) for a living. Like, how amazing is that, right? But also there's this slight little bit of panic of like, even if one wanted to stop, you couldn't just stop. Yeah. Uh, cause it's the job you'd have to like plan and like, I don't know. Has that, have you ever thought about stopping the blog? Oh yeah. A few times. Do you have an I, exit strategy? No. <laughs> <laughs> One of the, so it is really difficult. One of the big moments of, um, 
thinking, oh, well, maybe I should stop, came around the breakup with my ex-partner. So we, we split up summer of 2020. We properly stopped seeing each other this summer, so 2021. Mm. And I thought, well, I don't have my muse anymore. Like I, most of what I was writing about was stuff that we did together and, you know, all the adventures that we got up to. And I realised that my blog was becoming a really maudlin place. So I thought, well, maybe now's an opportunity to stop and get a proper job, proper job, <laughs> a salaried job where they <laughs> pay me holiday time and all that sort of thing. But because the, of the way the blog works, I have contractual obligations until at least the end of 2022, what with advertising on the blog. I've got, got the a book Patreon. The oh, Patreon, yeah. Right. Patreon's maybe slightly easier because I think I could just, if I did want to quit, I could just one month do like a big last goodbye for Patreons and then that's it. But now I've turned on annual subscriptions. So again, it yeah, it's... It is really difficult. I mean, I don't, I'm definitely not complaining because if I'm going to be trapped in a job, being trapped in my favourite job in the whole wide world is is certainly not a bad way to go. But yeah, you're right. It is, there is that worry. (laughs) I mean, why why did you start the blog in the first place though? Um, So I... With the the old ex-boyfriend that I mentioned before, we'd done a lot of kinky stuff together. So we met at university um, and we sort of both together discovered that we both happened to be massive perverts and did loads and loads of things. So we almost set up a sex blog together and he got cold feet, but it sort of sat in the back of my mind as something that I might be able to do. And then when Wait, we But now up, how did y'all two discover you both are perverts? Oh, uh, do you know, I mean with him, I could I can pinpoint a specific moment Love where it. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Um we'd been doing lots of surreptitious fucking at uni because he had a girlfriend who was at a different university. Um and we weren't really supposed to be shagging, but we were very into each other. And I was staying at his halls one night in these tiny little single beds that were definitely designed for only one person. And I spooned up behind him and was just sort of playing with him a little bit and made just a sort of gentle thrusting against him. And he suddenly went, oh, and I was like, oh, right. And I think at some point we had a conversation about, I said something like, I'd love to find a boy to come and fuck you. And he said, how about you be the boy? And then we went to this awful CD sex shop because back in the day you couldn't really buy stuff online. That's how old I am. That ages me. But then we went to this CD sex shop together and bought a really atrocious, definitely not body safe dildo for me to peg him with. And and things just sort of took off from there. <laughs> That's a pretty bold move to in the, you know... Assuming you're at least my age to in the mid 2000s or earlier suggest to a guy, I love to find a guy to fuck you. I feel like that was not as a, like today, I feel like you're, we're, we're training the Gen Zers to like not be so self-conscious. So even if someone proposes that to a straight guy, he can be like, no, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Right. Like, but back then I feel like that could have been loud. Oh yeah. I mean, so I think. There was something about him and there has been something about a few of the guys that I have been lucky enough to know in my life where it just sort of shines out of them. There's this pervy sense. And one of the things I love most about getting to know men is that the ones who I know and like the best, there are usually these little moments and little flashes where they'll just let you a tiny way into their brain and you can see that there's a lot of filth in there. And he was very much one of these guys. But like, I've had it with other guys where I've thought they were reasonably vanilla or not particularly into sex. And then, you know, we'll be walking down the street and I'll make some comment about wanking and he'll reply with, oh yeah, sometimes I tie shoelaces around my cock and balls while I have a wank. And I'm like, yes. Oh my God, you, you can fucking stay get in me my people (laughs) exactly (laughs) I've had other people I've had other people do it to me as well there was a guy I used to work with who was in the IT department and we go for cigarettes on break times and he asked me what I was doing at the weekend and I said I'm off to a party and he just looked me in the eye and went what kind of party and I was like you know you know (laughs) 
Yeah, it's it's fun to meet those like minded people in the wild because it's just, you know, I don't know. I That's why I will unabashedly speak. Like I don't if I you know, I work a lot of times I'll, I'll go to a coffee shop to, to do my work. And I'm not like pretty shy or like if I have to talk to somebody, if somebody comes to meet me or I got to do a call, I don't get too shy about talking about what I'm talking about because like I kind of want to put up the flare. Like I want to put the flag up like, everybody, <laughs> is this your flag too? Because you can come over one of the times that I was planning a gangbang in a coffee shop. Uh, the, the, the lady who uh, wanted me to organize it for her goes to the bathroom and the guy next to me leans over to be like, Oh, oh, hi, I couldn't help but over here. <laughs> and, but it turned out that he writes about sex for a living. He's a he's you know, he's a journalist and uh, sex is one of his beats. Oh, great. And I made like a new professional connection right there. Uh, other times it's a little bit more awkward. But like, are you guys really talking about gang wings? And I'm like, yeah. And then like, OK, I'm going to move. <laughs> You have fun. It's, I I know what you mean there. There's something really nice about when some you know someone makes that connection with you. I think as a woman, I'm more nervous about it because usually sure. when that happens with me, it is um, a creepy guys, and particularly if they're vanilla guys. I find that hmm, maybe this is a generalization, but there will often be vanilla guys who hear you talking about kink or being open about kink. And just assume that that means it is a complete free for all because they're so unfamiliar with, you know, the sex positive community and ideas and concepts such as consent and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, So I'm probably a little bit more nervous than that, but I'm definitely becoming more open about it. Like now that I'm single, I am shagging some people who I know through the blog or I know they know Girl on the Net and they knew Girl on the Net Mm. before they knew me which is a whole new uh it's a whole new field to plow in terms of <laughs> interactions with men well you know depending on if you're doing the plowing if you're getting plowed but I, yeah metaphor still stands <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah i mean the, the the thirst of dudes who hear about a a sexually open and adventurous woman will just be it's like really embarrassing Oh, you like sex? Cool. I like sex too. That means I can fuck. You want to fuck? Like you've alluded to it in some of your blog posts of the guys just like, yeah, I, I cool. I like sex too. When's the hotel room? Like, yeah. Oh. And you know what? As well, one of the interesting things this actually brings back to when you asked why I started the blog mm-hmm. is I think it also ties into this idea that a lot of men have, and it's not their fault. Like society has taught us that women don't like sex. What we like is money and shoes and love and stability and like we can like all of that stuff and also like getting banged um and one of the things that I find really frustrating as someone who really loves sex is that yeah there are a lot of men who have this it's sort of almost like an I don't believe you attitude and so often if they're saying oh well you should shag me then or you should do this or oh I'll I'll fuck you up the ass What they're doing is essentially the equivalent of men back in the late 90s, early noughties, who, when you told them you were a woman on a web forum, would be like, show us your tits then, prove it, prove you're a woman, pics or shut the fuck up, I don't believe you. And I find it's it's so annoying because it's just like, look, if you want to fuck women like me, then the absolute first thing you need to do is just acknowledge our existence. Just be fucking nice, man. Just say hello. Say hello. Don't be creepy. It's so easy to fuck women like me. You've just ruined it by being an obvious creep who doesn't recognize me as a person. Yeah, it's weird. Sorry, it's a little yeah, rant. The, <laughs> no, no, absolutely. We love rants. Uh, it, 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 there is something about also the, um, the the thirst coming from this, like, I think too many men who fuck women come from a place of scarcity that, like, every potential sexual opportunity is, has, like, such high stakes and it must, this has to be a time. I don't know when the next time I'm going to meet a slutty lady out in the wild is going to happen. So I, mu- I must pounce now instead of, like, how about just chill the fuck out? Like, take a deep breath yeah. and relax. And remember, there's a human being right in front of you. And it's like, I don't know. I get guys who ask, like, how do you get laid? I say, stop trying to get laid. It's amazing if you treat women like people. Sometimes they also want to fuck you. <laughs> uh, yeah. 
It's, it's, but it's one of those things. I mean, I, it frustrates me when men behave like that. But at the same time, mm. now that I'm getting back into dating, I think I have a little bit more compassion than I used to for why men behave like that, particularly on mm. dating sites. Just the sheer volume of messages that I will get. Just, I mean, I don't, I'm not on dating sites as girl on the net. I'm there as my real name. Mm. But there are a couple of hints in my profile that I like sex. So I'm inundated with messages. What's your hint? What are your hints? (laughs) I don't, do you know what? Genuinely, I'm not even going to tell you in case anybody listening to this comes across me on a dating site and is like, (gasps) that's her, that's gotten. Um, But not even like her. Like, I I feel like, you know, I look for things like that. If I'm not looking for any romance, if I'm not look, if I'm not swiping for a romantic connection at the time and I'm looking more for like fun casual, I don't like one night stands unless it's like a really elaborate scene. I like connecting and fucking, I like 10 night stands, toy night stands. Yeah. Um, oh, same, so yeah. I look for things in like a bio, like, like if I see GGG, right? Like that's a nice little like, oh, we're dropping a little buzzword, a little hint. Just give me a little something that says, hi, I read or talk about or I'm interested in sex or sexuality or something. Yeah, you know? I think, yeah, things like GGG are always really helpful hints. I mean, mm-hmm. I will... Uh, well, guys, don't put that in your fucking bio unless you did the homework first, okay? You have to know <laughs> what that means. Ladies, if you match with someone who has GGG in there, you better fucking ask, hey, what does GGG mean to you? Just to see. Just let's make sure they're not... It's like when people would put, um, you know, D&D and drug-free in, like, a Reddit post or a Craigslist ad... And I'd be like, do you know what the, that means? Or did you just put it in there because you saw other people put it in there? Because oh, yeah. D&D and disease free is is redundant because it, the, the D&D free was supposed to mean drug and disease free. But they don't know because somebody misused it once and then they copy and paste it. Ah, oh, yeah. No, I'm with you. Yeah. Don't put anything unless you understand it. I am. Um, yeah. I don't know if this is as common um, over there, but here in the UK, lots of lefty people will put no swerf and turf on their profile, which Mm -hmm. I like a lot because you're just in, sometimes there'll be no swerfs, no turfs, no Tories, which is excellent as well. And that kind of thing, I enjoy that because not only does it, it doesn't always indicate they're kinky, but it does indicate that they understand gender politics. They are Mm -hmm. lefty enough that they give a shit and they are read up on it. And they, you know, I'm not going to have to have extremely basic conversations with center right men who don't understand why it's important to respect a pronoun. So that's kind of thing I think is really helpful. I love the generous. My favorite stereotype might be that uh, liberals are better in bed than conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, I've not fucked enough Tories to be really sure, <laughs> but I don't know if I want to do that experiment. <laughs> what was it like the the first post you put out? Like, what was it like to put out that first really personal anal story or whatever the fuck? Oh, the first one ever on the blog. Yeah. God, you know, you're putting you're you're for the first time putting something so personal and allegedly private, you're putting it out publicly. Like when you hit that publish, what did was there any sort of feeling or rush? Uh, do you know, I I think back then it felt so mild just because I had hardly any followers. I think when I started blogging, I had maybe 2 or 300 followers. And mm. so and I was kind of used to talking about horny stuff on Twitter. There was definitely a thrill uh, when people started reading it. I I very quickly started getting quite a lot of traffic. And so, this sounds so narcissistic, I think. My thrill is not in putting the post live. My thrill is in seeing when people respond to it. So Mm -hmm. if I put something up, very recently I wrote about an absolutely exceptional threesome that I had with two lovely people and I knew that that post was going to be popular and I thought quite a lot of people would respond to it but as soon as it went out it got tons of retweets and that was a real thrill because I was like I feel like I want to treat something precious like something like that I want to treat it preciously and show that I'm framing it right and being careful and you know talking about things in a nice way so the fact that people responded to it really well, I was like, yay, I'm so glad you haven't shown me up in front of these people that I had a threesome with, or I haven't shown myself up. You know, I've done justice to the to the cool things they did to me. Mm. And, and you know, in addition to all the really hot stories that you post on there, including, by the way, some of them have 
audio attached, which then I heard, I was listening to your voice talk about the uh, come in my ass versus come in my cunt. Uh. <laughs> I was like, this is uncomfortable right before the interview. I did, <laughs> you know, okay. I'm delighted you enjoyed it. That's the most popular one this year. <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah, I've, uh, I've got both my hands are in the air for accountability. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was like that voice because you have this fucking sultry like you your your voice was made for erotica the way some dudes dicks were made for porn. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, my God. That is genuinely one of the greatest compliments I've ever had. Thank you. <laughs> No problem. Much obliged. Uh, you know, but like, I imagine you also post not happy, not hot things on the blog as well. Yeah, I do. I, I, I think I've described it before as like, my job is to yank my heart out through my cunt and smear it all over the internet. So like, oh my God, <laughs> eat your heart out. Well, women, what's going Whoa, <laughs> the imagery. It's very, I, I think what I do and what I love doing, and I don't, I've, I've still haven't quite got to grips with whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. But what I really like doing is taking emotions, whether that is, you know, arousal or happiness or joy or misery or love or whatever, and really kind of trying to make other people feel those emotions as well. So I've written quite a few posts about the breakup and during the breakup, because this guy, I would properly have said he was the love of my life at the time and I felt very strongly about him. And obviously having blogged about him so much, loads of my readers loved him too. Yeah. And I know it's almost maybe a bit cruel of me, but I wanted them to feel the same gut punch of, you know, misery and heartbreak because I think it helps other people to be able to put their emotions into words as well. And, you know, whether that is... I really enjoy taking up the ass or I felt really heartbroken during this moment. Being able to give people that feeling where they can say, oh, yeah, me too. It makes them feel less alone. Like mm. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who feels this way or, I'm, you know, I enjoy doing that. And I I mean, I'm, this is awful, but I'm almost gleeful about it. If I if I'm sad and I can make other people sad, too, then it's like, yes, I've achieved a thing. I've shared this and then I feel less bad. And then hopefully they feel less bad because they're also sharing in this kind of communal outpouring of emotion. And that communal emotion, I mean, but that comes from the that will come from the sad breakup story. But the same thing will come from the taking it up the ass story. It's, oh, me too. I'm not weird. I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who wants like a nice juicy load up my butt. Like there, <laughs> there are people like that can bring a sense of comfort for people if they live in the you know middle of butt fuck, but we don't talk about butt fucking nowhere. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and they don't have anyone to share that with, you know, like I live in New York City. We're talking about pegging every day in coffee shops, gang things, <laughs> whatever. But, you know, you go out to Iowa. I I don't think you can talk about uh, I don't think I could comfortably plan a gang bang in, a, in an Iowa diner. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, so the Internet gives people that place where they can talk about it. And I think mm -hmm. there's parallels as well between. So, you know, if you read a really sexy blog post or listen to some sexy audio and you have a wank, there's a sense of release and relief and catharsis. You know, you have indulged yourself in this fantasy and you've let it build and build and then you've kind of, you know, released and let go. And likewise with something that's sad, like whenever I am feeling particularly down or like it's two days before my period and I'm miserable for no reason, I will often just pick like an old film that I know will make me cry. Independence Day is always a classic, Deep Impact. I love films like that. And I'll get that same kind of release, an emotional release. And I think it's similar to having a wank sometimes. You need to let yourself feel a feeling, really wallow in it, and then the dam bursts and you don't feel you know, you've kind of let it go a little bit. A hundred percent. I just am surprised by the movie choice. of uh, <laughs> Like I do, I believe in having the emotional wank with a good movie. I'm just surprised it's like Independence Day. Yeah, uh, honestly, you know? <laughs> I don't know why. It's so cheap. I do, it's, when he does the speech, I don't know why. It's just so cheap, but it makes me cry. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, I, I guess you could say, OK, like uh, I re it'd be like rewatching Armageddon just to get to the part when Ben Affleck's like, Harry, no, you know, <laughs> but like other than that, 
it's a Michael Bay explosion movie. I'm more of like a 500 days of summer kind of bitch myself. But okay. hey, whatever <laughs> gets the tears going for you, it's, who am I to argue? It's very personal. It's like porn. I, might, I reckon everyone's got different like cry boner kinks, just as we have mm. different erotica kinks. But yeah, a good old cry yeah. is always ha- handy. And, and, you know, when you said that, you know, going through the breakup, your readers, your regular followers, they know who this person is in concept. They're a character in the story of your life, just as like, especially being anonymous, you are a character to them. They are following you over a decade on this love and sex journey of yours. And I, you know, I'm I'm sim- similar way. I, there's that element where I'm bringing these people from my past onto the show in the present. And also whatever my present sex and dating life is, you know, if I start dating someone seriously and like I have a girlfriend, like that girlfriend's kind of like a character in this man whore podcast universe, so to speak, right? And like they are familiar with who she is and the fun stories and the sexy stories and 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 what have you um so it kind of ties back into that privacy conversation uh, into that blog post of yours of just you know who is going to be a character how will we portray these characters um in a way that's both like fulfilling artistically uh and follows whatever ethic you want to have in place for yourself yeah i'd be really interested to know like what is your approach? Do you have a kind of set approach or does it depend on who you're talking about? Because mm. I think character is a is a useful word and one that I try to keep front of mind because I think as soon as I turn someone into blog content, they do immediately become a character and they're never going to be, you know, the fully rounded person that I know them to be in real life. Um, mm. So yeah, uh, yeah. How do you How do you do that? Do you have a specific approach for how you do it uh so yeah my when it comes to like a girlfriend like someone's going to be a static force in my life there will be like a podcast conversation okay. like there's the girlfriend conversation there's an i love you's w- thing and and then there's the like okay so am i referring to you by like a letter or a name am i allowed to share photos of us on my social media because People will put two and two together. And in terms of talking about my past, I mean, I'm not naming names. I'm not giving enough information. Anyone could possibly identify the person. And and then I try to take it from my story at that point. Yeah. Uh, And then also trying to be mindful of like, you know, am I telling a story that isn't mine to tell? Uh, That's something I've become aware of. So I try to uh, factor that in. It must be so much. Oh, there's so much I want to pull out of that because it's really fascinating, particularly because you're because you are visual and visible there's a whole extra layer of stuff that I think I feel very lucky I don't have to navigate that because you know I'd never I would never put pictures of me and someone else on social media um I'd never put pictures of me on social media but yeah I think the it's one of the things that I think I struggle with is when I've said I want to write about someone I'm very not touchy or precious, but I'm cautious about the idea of giving them editorial rights. Right. But I'm absolutely up for them saying exactly as you said, you know, don't write about this thing or don't write about, there were a couple of like kinks that my ex didn't want me to write about and was like, can you just not mention this kind of thing? And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. So that sort of setting boundaries, I think is really useful. But then once I've got the go ahead to write a post. I'm like, I'm happy for them to take out details where I, you know, it might not be anonymous enough or, you know, they, they need me to obscure certain things, but I wouldn't want them to take out anything. I wouldn't want them to edit my text. Like, because the, I think that would make, it would suddenly turn it into something very impersonal and I'm not used to being edited like that unless I'm writing a book. Um, it's also art. Like you like, like get off. Like ha- I have a hands off my art mentality when it comes mm. to what you're describing. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. And to be honest, I think my general approach to it, because my general approach is I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out and write a really mean post about someone. The kinds Mm. of things that I'm writing and that I'm referring to in the post that you originally contacted me off the back of, 
those are beautiful, fun, sexy moments. And so I'm not going to mention the, you know, the bit where I fumbled around to try and find a condom or like the bit where they said something silly and then got embarrassed in the heat of the moment or anything like that. What I'm doing is I am looking through my very rose tinted glasses at the things that we did and telling people about the things that I loved and that were brilliant and that were hot, that were surprising and unusual. I'm never going to write a post, I hope, that the person who slept with me looks at and thinks, oh, she didn't like it or she had a bad time. Mm. And I think when it comes to the ethics of writing about that sort of thing, that is a big, big question mark that I still haven't resolved because I I will have bad experiences and there are often really interesting posts in, for instance, the shitty things that men might say on dates or, you know, bad behaviours that are common, um, that sort of thing. Um, I once had somebody suggest to me writing a guest blog about um, condom use because this was a friend of mine who was very surprised that even generally sex positive men, there are a lot of them who still have some pretty rubbish practices when it comes to condoms. Um, And they were like, oh, you should, you should write about that. And I sort of thought, okay, well I could do, and I probably will at some point, but I don't want to write about that kind of thing right now while I'm dating, because those are practices that people might be doing. (laughs) And so I don't want the whole blog, uh, you know, I don't want to write a blog post that looks like a subtweet about someone or that makes someone I've shagged feel bad because I think... like if someone's got shitty condom practices, like do they deserve to not feel bad about that? uh, It's common enough that I wouldn't want to... I wouldn't want to shit on anyone for it. I think it... And I'm not talking a guy who just prefers not using a condom and is 100% agreeable and like, oh, you want to use condoms? Great. Like, use it, no argument... Um, but like the guy who's trying to maybe push, be like, come on, can we not? Tries to sit. Oh, no. The guy who puts in a tip. I mean, do, does that guy deserve any consideration at that point? Oh, no, not that guy. But that's not what I'm talking okay. about. Let me try and I'm going to try and give you a hypothetical. So I'm not discussing a real thing. <laughs> um, sure. But so, for instance, um, if someone takes a condom out of the packet, puts it on the end of their dick, but it's the wrong way around, they then just flip it over and put it back on. That's not safe because then you're still potentially uh, you're still potentially causing problems and what you should do is get a new condom. That's extremely Wait, that, common. that's not safe? Nope. Ah, oh, fuck. Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's safe for you. It's safe for you, the person with the mm. dick, because it's only ever touched your dick. It's not safe for the person it's going in. Now, I should, before I oh, accidentally I exa- worry okay. people, before I accidentally worry people, it, it is not a... The chances of STI transmission are reasonably low with that, but it's still not great condom practice. Likewise, sure. here's another example that is surprisingly common, is if the condom comes off inside someone, which it does a lot, like this just happens a lot, particularly with guys who um, struggle, I don't know what, I'm being really cisnormative, sorry, people with penises who sometimes struggle to get hard or if you're like in and out and changing position a lot and doing lots of things, often condoms will come off inside people. I've had that happen to me a lot. I very rarely had anyone actually say to me, oh, just so you know, the condom came off inside you. Like often we'll just finish your pause and then I'll go to the bathroom and be like, oh, you could have fucking told me. <laughs> so like just silly things like that. I don't mean like non-consent because non-consent I think sure. is a different issue, but just sort of slight things that are like not great practice. Now I could write about that, but I'm not going to write about that now because I'm dating lots of people. What I would do probably is wait a long time into the future and then do something that's a much more general advice type post and get some you know input from other people. So it's not based on my personal experience. I deliberately chose them because they're things other people have spoken to me about recently. What stood out to me about just even the concept of your practice, which, and and, and now I'm feeling more comfortable about your post because it sounds like it's more your ethic and not what you think everyone's like, it's, it doesn't sound like it's a standard. You think everyone must adhere to this standard, right? Yeah. Or rather, I, it's your standard. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm in, I think everybody should have a standard. Sure. But I don't think it's up to me to dictate what that should be. Because I think the world needs to be told lots of different sex stories. And 
I'm always very aware of the fact that I'm I'm extremely privileged. I'm a white middle class woman who's reasonably posh. And although I was poor when I was young, I am basically fine and I lead a very charmed life. And so my approach to this stuff is not going to be in any way the same as someone who's had a very different background and has, you know, will have been treated very differently by sexual partners and all that kind of thing. I think I'm wary of, I'm wary of an attitude which just says, fuck it, we should just be able to say what we like. I think lots of writers I know would, um, oh, what's the phrase? If people wanted you to write well about them, they should have behaved better. That's like kind of a common uh, thing. And I'm not sure I necessarily 100% agree with that because I think that your writing reflects on you as well as on the people that you're writing about. And I think it is important to have some kind of rule, rule, is that the right word? Kind of personal ethics, which sure. just sort of guide you. Because otherwise, you know... I don't know, Just even just for your own personal peace of mind, it's helpful to have your own idea of, OK, well, this is this is how far I will go and no further. But, yeah, I'm definitely not telling anyone else that they should do exactly what I do because, uh, you know, everyone's different. <laughs> Did you have any kind of trips or missteps in developing that ethos? I, I've definitely had... Um, guest bloggers so I publish one guest blog every week and have done for years and years since like a couple of years after I started the blog and I've definitely had guest bloggers who have sent me stories that have been published as guest blogs and they've then subsequently asked me to take them down um, because they've realized that it's too identifiable that hasn't happened with any of my posts and the reason it hasn't happened with any of my posts is because I understand what anonymity means. And anonymity means I never share my blog from my real life channels. I never, ever use my name to promote my work. I never cross the streams, I, you know, all of that kind of thing. Whereas I think for other people, they'll often put their story up and assume that because it says anon, no one will guess. But of course... Mm. If your name is Dave Smith and you then go and share your blog post from your Twitter account and your friend who you shagged when you were Dave Smith, who you've just written about, you know, they follow you and they see you and they're like, why the fuck are you writing about me? So that's kind of the closest I've come to having a problem with it. It was a person writing anonymously, but they shared it from the real account because they couldn't help but want the notoriety. Yeah. So they had, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that's happened. It's happened a few times. And mm -hmm. it's really tough. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell other people, you can't do this. I will warn people sometimes, like, just so you know, the way you've just contacted me through a work email address, for instance, and you're pitching me a guest blog about this time you fucked your boss. Maybe don't, <laughs> maybe don't do that. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> just, yeah. But, you know, most people don't live, I, I live in a sort of, paranoid fug of constantly being worried about my anonymity that's not as mm. true today as it was when I first started because when I first started I had a job I would have lost if they found out what I did whereas now it doesn't matter so much but yeah I think my my general rule now is if I were outed if some you know I don't know no one would care probably but let's say people gave a shit and my real name got out there and suddenly everybody could put names to faces on my blog would the people I have written about regret having ever met me? <laughs> and I mm. hope that answer is no. Even the ones who have sometimes treated me badly or said some things that I've been critical of or whatever, I hope that very, very few of them would say they don't come across well. I, I would like them to still be proud. You know, even yeah. my ex with whom I've recently broken up and obviously there's loads of complexity and heartbreak and sadness. I have not stuck the knife in because it would just be awful because broadly I'm extremely grateful to have been lucky enough to have him in my life. And so going to the blog and being like, oh, he said this and he did this and oh, it just feels really petty and mean and unfair. But now if he ever reached out and 
I'm I'm sure this was a conversation you all have probably already had in, in the course of the breakup, but just hypothetically, if he reached out a year from now and said, hey, can you just take out all the, it, it's crushing my soul every time to know that all that is out there. Would you delete all those posts for like 10 years of a relationship? Do you know what? It's such a good question because I think, so I, I firmly believe that if your ex asks you to delete their nudes, you should. And so what technically is the difference here? Like I'm writing about things that are really personal to him. Oh, come on, no. Words versus nude images. Do we really want to tie those, like make those at all equal stature? Uh, for, so it, it it's going to depend on the person. But for me, yeah. Like mm-hmm. I think the difference is they're not his words. If they were his words, then it's a different question because yeah. they don't belong to me. The difficult The difficulty here genuinely is I can't. And it's not just I can't like I don't want to, although I don't want to, but it's also I can't like I wrote about him in books and those books, the rights are under contract to other people. A lot of the work that is on my blog, like some of it has been sub-licensed elsewhere. And this is a really cheating answer because I don't want to give my actual answer. But I, I think basically the answer is I can't. If he said, stop writing about me, because I do still sometimes mention him. I, you know, would do posts about the breakup and talk about how sad I am and how I miss him. If he contacted me and said, please stop talking about me, then I absolutely would. I would be like, okay, from now on. But then, yeah, because that's defaulting to the the standard you've set. But in terms of like deleting old things, like I've had... I mean, I have my my past hookups are on the show less often now. Um it becomes a harder sell the the more the thing. I think some I think some of the women agreed early on because it was like whatever. Who's going to hear this? And now that it's like a real thing, it's like ooh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so it, it's not the easiest sell in the world. But uh, you know, I, I I've had people on occasion hit me up to delete episodes. What What have you done? What's your What's your approach? So I actually got like a, an email about this from someone who was binging through the whole show and he noticed that there were a few episode numbers missing. Now, two of them are comedians who were under their real name, but they stopped doing comedy and they like, you know, one was like, hey, trying to find a job. I don't do comedy anymore. All my, you know, all, things are deleted, but this was my real name. And when you Google me, my first Magnum condom with blank still shows up. Okay. So like... So like that, those two comedian ones I I, I deleted, uh, be, but it's because they stopped doing comedy, took themselves out. Okay, and then I had one past hookup who did hit me up, and I mean she called me in full on tears, and it was early enough in the show, like I'd probably been doing the show like two or three years at that point, and yeah, I, I, I her reasons weren't for me now good reasons like i just don't like that it's up there like i'm a different person now whatever because i'm like use a different name you couldn't possibly identify this woman there's nothing to tie but in the moment i felt like you know my empathy strings like exploded and i was like okay and i took it down okay but then like i noticed there were others who have asked and i was like i can't i can't have i have to set a standard where i'm like I can't do that. Like, unless there's a privacy concern that's real, I can't just take shit down because you don't like that it's it's in existence. Yeah. Because, like, this is my job. This is my business. Like, if, if I allow everyone veto power to take things down after the fact because of something you shared, I mean, you chose to share that. You have to be responsible for the words that come out of your mouth. And if I let people let make me delete shows at will i have no show yeah Uh, so when it comes to those personal people what i do try to do and i think i've done a decent job probably getting better over the years um in doing is when i have those types of guests on these for all intents and purposes real people um you know i always have said hey we can use a fake name if you want to uh i always ask like hey what's off limits let me know beforehand like i kind of try to set it up yeah but then once we do the thing you kind of like you have to take ownership. Hey, I've said things that were like a mistake and I've had to like take accountability for what comes out of my face or out of my fingers. So it's like I feel like we should all be responsible for what we say. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So my eth- my ethic now is like I, I can't, I'll try to set it up as best I can. But like 
I need a God, a real compelling reason to take it down that goes beyond your feelings. I think, which is sad because like I'm a very empathetic person, so it makes me sad to tell someone no, and I know I have to do it. I think you're right as well, though, and I think there's also there's a real um, false sense of security. If somebody says, can you take this down? So let's say, hypothetically, I had a blog post about someone I shagged and they said, oh, well, can you take this down? Hypothetically, you had a blog <laughs> post about someone you shagged. Who would do such a thing? Well, no, I mean, no one's ever asked me, genuinely, no one's ever asked me to take down anything I've written about them, as far as I can remember. Yeah. But so let's say I went, OK, fine, I'll take it down. Well, the problem is that post has almost certainly been quoted elsewhere, been copied elsewhere. It exists. There will be tweets where I have tweeted quotes out from the post when I was originally promoting it. That post exists on the Internet. And once Mm. things exist on the Internet, you can't really get rid of them. Like you're very lucky if you manage to delete something embarrassing about yourself from the Internet. It just doesn't really happen. If I delete an episode, people still have that file. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so... As a general rule, like my my thing is always to try and be as upfront as possible. So when I'm sending people posts and saying, hey, I had a great time fucking you. Here's a beautiful thing I wrote about it. I will say to them, like, be aware that this is going to go online. It will be there forever. Like before you say yes, the, the moment at which you can decide whether you want this or not is any point before yeah. I hit publish. Yeah. Mm. As soon as I've hit the publish button that post is out there and people have it, you know, the people rip stuff off all the time. I'm constantly playing like pop-ups with websites where they just rip off content wholesale, including all the images that my artist Stuart draws for the stuff. Mm. It's really annoying, but it happens. And so, yeah, from a, even just from a boring practical perspective, things cannot be deleted. But yeah, I, as I say, I would strongly hope I would never write anything that someone would be actively ashamed of. But I guess there's the possibility that, like, you know, someone finds Jesus and doesn't want him to know that I once fisted them or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and you might find this interesting because, like, I definitely had to... So I had a blog the tail end of college, and right after college, I I no longer do anymore, and I've I've since taken the whole thing down, in part because of this uh, topic, where I I was being first introduced to the idea of other people's privacy. And Uh. I I was of a mindset, and it's an interesting idea I haven't engaged with in a while, so I don't know how I feel right now. But at the time, I thought, well, I I started this blog called The Unfriended All-Stars. And it, every Sunday, I blogged about someone I deleted on Facebook. Okay. And this is like 2000, you know, 10, 2011. And the idea to me was like, we, we have all these like, quote unquote, friends on Facebook, but we're not actually friends with them. We don't interact digitally, so we don't serve any virtual po- purpose. And then because of all the things that would be on a profile, photos, videos, et cetera, it's like we're giving people we barely know, we took a class with and never spoke to, we're giving them, and that we don't interact with online, we're giving them access to so much of ourselves. And by doing so, are we not all kind of in the public eye unless we choose our privacy settings, which a lot of people don't actively engage with. We have the tools to have privacy. A lot of people don't want to take the patience to actually select the right buttons that fit for their comfort level. Oh, especially back then on Facebook. Like so many people would just have everything out there. Yeah. But you didn't have to. And and so I was I did this thing where I would people who fit this category of like, we don't really engage online. There's no reason to be connected like this. So I'm going to unfriend you. And I would write like a cheeky blog post, like except for a few guys who were like really shitty people to me in high school. It it was cheeky. It would be like I unfriended her because she likes keeping up with the Kardashians. And then I'm doing like jokes about the Kardashians. Or it's like this dude played lacrosse. We know about those lacrosse guys. But like it's rarely that I was like really indicting that person themselves. Okay. But like I did use their real name and I would use a photo that they made publicly available to people they were not connected to. And so like, yeah, sometimes I would get some shit. And (laughs) uh, like people loved reading it. People would be like, oh, my God, this is hilarious. But then sometimes people would hit me up because they wanted it down. And I'd usually say no. Um, But I was also a bit of a bastard uh, back then. (laughs) Do you know, I think it's so 
One of the things I'm really grateful for is that I grew up in this generation where, you know, when we were kids, no one had the internet. I grew up just learning about the internet through dial up and all that kind of early days, like wild west of it. And now we are really having to get to grips with some extremely complex stuff around privacy and ethics and what we want to share and what we don't. And the idea of living dual lives, which just wouldn't even have been a thing when I was younger. And it is really difficult. Like, I don't know anybody of my generation who hasn't been an absolute tool online when we were younger because you just didn't know. And there are so many different kind of rules. Like, I think I've always been fairly compartmentalized. So I used to be a member of a web forum, which I will not mention. But luckily for me, it has now been ripped from the internet. Not a trace of it exists anywhere, including all of my posts, which I'm very pleased about. But I was quite aggressive and fighty and trolly on this forum. And I always made sure to have different personas for different places I was getting involved because I liked Mm. having that separation and being able to go and be this person over here and you know indulge this snarky side of myself and then over here I could be a you know a different kind of nicer person (laughs) and I think I'm doing the same here maybe a bit with Girl on the Net where Girl on the Net is where I allow myself to enjoy all of this kind of aspect of my life and I don't have to think about all the boring shit like you know paying my mortgage and making it so that my neighbors don't keep making noise through my wall which you might have heard some of um like all the kind of boring life shit is one persona and then girl on the net can be this other persona and I think I don't know I don't think everybody should manage their internet lives that way but for people who aren't sure about indulging in things like you know sex or drugs or anything that is often covered in shame having a separate persona is always a really fun way of of doing it <laughs> yeah yeah uh and, and and so and so how are you uh how are you enjoying single life oh uh, do you know i hear gang i hear the gang bangs are hard for you to to obtain oh uh, well okay so gang bangs it's not that they're hard for me to obtain. I could obtain a gangbang tomorrow if... Okay, sorry. I should say a good gangbang with yes. people you want to have a gangbang with. I know I always got qualified that Amen. Way. A good gangbang with good people. So basically what I am doing is as I make my merry way through singledom, uh, if I meet a guy who I think might be up for it and might be a good fit with the ones I already have recruited, then I will talk to him about mm. it. So far, I have three who I'm pretty sure are in. I think maybe only two of those would really get on with each other. I'm not sure yet. More research required. Um, But one of the things I'm really enjoying about being single is being able to just sort of be a bit playful about this stuff again. Like I think I, I don't generally see life as a big bucket list and I need to tick all this different stuff off. But I'm now meeting guys who are um, polyamorous or, you know, much more open and for whom this is, you know, it's not a surprise. Ten years ago when I was last single, men were constantly surprised by the fact that I like sex. Whereas now, you know, a lot has happened in ten years and we can just be Mm. a bit more playful with it, which I'm really enjoying. Although the one thing, my one complaint, I shouldn't complain, I'm happy. Only one. Oh, do you know, I shouldn't complain. I'm having a fucking lovely time. My, well, here's the thing. So the guys I'm dating at the moment all know me as Girl on the Net. They're either people mm. who have been following my blog for a while, who I've made friends with, or friends from the past, or um, uh, people's husbands. I've got a couple of <laughs> a couple of women offered me their husbands, and I was like, lovely, thank you. Offered you their husband. Yeah, I've got a date with one on Thursday. I'm so excited. How does that come about? What's the exchange like? Uh, so I it genuinely, I wrote a blog post uh, called A Brief... Send Me Your Husbands? No, no. I mean, almost exactly that. But it was called a uh, Presentation on Why You Should Let Me Borrow Your Boyfriend. Um, <laughs> And it was, I wrote it about a specific guy that I had a crush on. And I thought, oh, I wonder if his girlfriend would lend him to me. So I basically wrote it like I was just trying to persuade her to lend him to me. And a couple of women who I knew already um, got in touch with me and were like, do you want my husband? And both of the husbands are extremely lovely guys. And 
one of them I'd had a crush on for a while since I knew him at this conference. So I was like, brilliant. So I'm dating some husbands. So this is all great. And I'm very excited. But they all know that I'm girl on the net. And there's a definite tone to that, which I would, I'm going to get on the dating sites properly back in, properly in January and see if I can go on a couple of dates with people who can just meet me as a normal person, normal person, you know, meet me and not know that I'm a sex blogger. And because I think there's a power imbalance when people know that I'm gotten, sometimes they're a bit uh, starstruck and it's not their fault at all. It's it's something that I need to learn to navigate, but it would be nice. They to know meet. so much about you and like your butthole and like, you know, <laughs> nothing about their butthole. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I would like to meet someone who knows nothing about my butthole just right. for the first few dates. And then I'll tell them about the blog if, you know, if, right. if we shag well. Um, but yeah, it, as a general, like, yeah, gen- my general baseline, single life is fucking lovely and I adore it. And I've been just completely blown away by how many men from my present or my past have just come out the woodwork to be like, do you want to bang? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> Woo-hoo. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy girl. for you. <laughs> Uh, that, and do you think you'll get into like another romantic relationship uh, in the near future? Oh. Is not monogamous. It sounds like y'all might have been somewhat monogamous for that decade. So like, is non monogamy a thing? You're like, oh, maybe this will be a relationship model. Do you know? I I would. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately because I will write about it at some point. I would love to be non-monogamous. I would really, I think it makes a lot of sense, especially for someone like me. I know lots of people who do non-monogamy in ways that is extremely happy and fulfilling. However, if I look into my heart and my soul and consider what I think I'm genuinely like, I think I probably am monogamous or monogamish at the very least. So like my ex and I would sometimes shag our friends or do little things together, but it was always together. Mm-hmm. And I, I sort of hate that about me. I, it, it feels like I'm just sentencing myself to, to monogamy. But I, I do, I think that's where my heart goes. So at the moment, my attitude is like, quick, cram in all the fun I can have for the next like couple of years. And then maybe after that, I'll probably end up falling in love with someone and then I'll mm. be monogamous and then that's what I'll be in. Um, God, it sounds awful. I'm talking about monogamy in really bad ways. I don't, lo- think, <laughs> I, I don't think it sounds awful. I wanted to reassure you of uh, if, if your ideal relationship model is like being with one person that you love and sometimes y'all play together in whether it's at a party or a gangbang or with friends or with a third or whatever. Mm. I mean, that is in my non-expert opinion because i'm just a comedian with a fuck show but you know (laughs) i that's not monogamous because to me monogamy is you two agree not to do anything else with other people and anything beyond that is not so i think you are not monogamous (laughs) and there's just a style of it that is more emotionally safe for you so if you want to be non-monogamous hey here's the little i crowned the Totally non-monogamous. Ah, thank you. That makes me feel a lot better. That makes me feel a lot better. I think I I have a real... It's not that I look down on monogamy and I don't think other people look down on monogamy. I think there is just... There's a bit of me that sort of wants to be a bit more capable of sustaining lots of different relationships. Mm. But I just... I love the teamwork of monogamy. Like when Mm. it works and is good... And I know lots of people say, oh, well, you can't expect one person to fulfill all your needs. And that's absolutely true. But that's why I have friends. I've got loads of brilliant friends and I can have lots of fulfilling relationships and also have one person who I love, you know, Mm. who ideally bangs me really good and is exactly the right amount of filth and all that kind of stuff. So maybe, yeah. Maybe. Well, I, I hope that for you. And uh, thank you. <laughs> that's very, that's very nice. Very rare that monogamy gets like positive plugs on the show. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, I hope you find that uh, slutty other someone who who wants to uh, be slutty and filthy with you in the way that uh, feels safe and wonderful. Thank you uh, so much. 
G, do you have like an extra like 10, 15 minutes by chance in your schedule? Maybe do a little bonus episode? Do you know? Yes, I do. I, w- I want to talk to you some more about like actual sex blogging and the words of of creating such sultry language that, that Ooh, turns okay. so many people on. Yeah. So, uh, but for now, G, where can people go to find at girl on the net i can only guess so it's all i try to keep it all the same girl on the net.com at girl on the net on twitter facebook slash girl on the net it's girl on the net everywhere girl on the net uh gee thank you so much for chatting with us and uh patreon people you're gonna hear that bonus episode tomorrow but for now why don't you go ahead and say goodbye to everybody thank you all so much this has been so fun and i've really enjoyed our chat so yay thank you it's been super fun talking filth If you feel a little bit edged, if you feel like we kind of did a little bit like a, you know, a denial situation by ending the conversation with got in that soon because you're like, gosh, I just needed like 10, 15 more minutes of her voice. And I'm here to tell you there's like another half hour of this woman on the bonus episode exclusively on Patreon. That's coming out for all my $5 up fan horse tomorrow at patreon.com slash man podcast that's patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash man podcast would love to know what you thought about this week's episode in the champagne room in the champagne room our wonderful super free discord server there is a channel called episode discussion and in there you talk to fellow fan whores and you talk about the topics of a week's episode talk about an old episode if you're one of those people binging forward introduce yourself today to over 400 fellow fan whores at manwhorepod.com slash discord gotten and i are very big on the twitter so i'm gonna like heavily say we would love for you to shout out this episode on Twitter. She is at Girl on the Net. I am at the Billy Presida. Let us know what you thought. And if you want to share it directly with me, maybe it's a thought that's longer than 280 characters. Maybe you want to share your slutty 2022 New Year resolution with me. Shoot me an email at manhorpod at gmail.com. Last but certainly not least, hey, if you want to check me out in a jockstrap, if you want to see me playing with the delicious Angel Amore, if you just are curious to have a cute guy on the internet flirting with you, regardless of gender, you can follow for free at OnlyFans.com slash CallMeBilly. Uh, I'm on a little podcation, everybody. I, uh, you're, you're not going to hear anything terribly topical from me for for the month of january i've uh, i've uploaded everything for january i'm giving myself a little break don't i deserve such a nice thing i gotta i gotta i gotta work on this dirty haiku book that i got in mind i gotta bang out some haikus the patreon people know what those are about next week we've got an, a, a, an awesome conversation with sex educator susan bratton and then we're gonna have uh author ricky tucker talking about new york ballroom culture all the fans oppose. You don't want to miss that episode. And then the week after that, we're going to have on a uh, m- new memoirist, David Pevsner, who has a book out called Damn Shame. I got a great lineup for you all this month. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you are enjoying your new year thus far. And I hope you're finding a way to safely stay slutty. <laughs> Thank you.